Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us. My name is Petra Carlson and I would like to welcome all of you to this live broadcast with an international audience addressed by Helga Zepler Rouge. We have a broad international audience and the webcast will be translated into German, French, Italian and Spanish. And everybody are welcome to send in questions during the procedure, during the next couple of hours. We have dangerous, severe global crisis, uh, but the potential for change in a good direction is also there. In the transatlantic region, we have the danger of immediate hyperinflation. You also have the breakdown of the physical economy that is escalating day by day. Now, on top of that, the situation in Southwest Asia and North Africa is really dramatically uh, turning into something that could quickly lead to a third world war, and that with thermonuclear weapons. Now, many people ask themselves what they can do. How is it possible for me, as a single individual, to actually intervene into this situation? And I don't know anyone better to address and answer exactly these questions than Helga Zeplerug herself. She is not only the chairwoman of the German party, Büso, the civil rights movement in Germany, but she is also the president of the, Schiller, of the International Schiller Institute. And she has organized for the last three or four decades internationally for the project Eurasian Land Bridge. She has organized more than hundreds of conferences in Europe, in Asia, internationally, with governmental officials, with diplomats, with professors, people from different institutions. She has also revived the classical tradition in Germany of the German classics. She has in depth studied the great thinker Nicolas of Cusa and also the philosopher Friedrich Schiller. So without further ado, uh, Helga Zeplerusch. Thank you. Hello, good evening, and good day. We are holding this international webcast uh, to generate an international debate about the situation that there is an alternative to the present policies. And I want to call at this occasion to all the viewers to mobilize for the realization of this alternative, which I'm going to present to you today. What we face as a human civilization is this. We are threatened with the immediate danger of a thermonuclear war, a third world war. If you look in the Middle East, Southwest Asia region, day by day, the tensions around Syria uh, are escalating. There could be a possible attack on Iran by Israel and possibly the United States, even this is a big fight, uh, around the uh, events of the Benghazi American consulates and the growing anti-Western demonstrations around the release of this blasphemic uh, video. Now, the events in Benghazi, the killing of the US Ambassador Stevenson, has been called by Linda LaRouche, my husband, September 11, number two. Now, if you look at this situation as a totality, uh, it is very clear that the Balkans, uh, th that the Middle East has become a new Balkans, where only one more incident could trigger a chain of reactions which could lead to a thermonuclear war on a global scale. If this would happen, it would for sure mean the extinction of civilization. Now, this is not unrelated to the fact that we are in the final phase of the collapse of the financial system of the transatlantic region. Right now, both the European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve have started a, publish, a, a, 
uh, a process of hyperinflationary printing of money. And um, this is threatening that this entire transatlantic region will have very shortly a hyperinflation like it happened in Germany in 1923. Now, if you look at these two combined and interrelated dangers, we have a situation where it is very clear civilization is about to crash against the wall. And we have to have an immediate paradigm shift and you know, we have to mobilize all possible forces to accomplish that. Now, if you look at the situation in Southwest Asia, um, it is comparable to the Balkans before World War I, because you have an evolution of conflicts and alliances which tend to have a chain reaction uh, character, and they are almost already out of control. You can say that maybe only one more trigger would be necessary and the thing is leading to a catastrophe. There is a danger uh, of an Israeli strike against Iran, possibly before the US elections. There are numerous scenarios circulating about a possible breakaway ally scenario where Israel would do something and then draw the United States uh, into it. Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu has repeatedly insisted in the recent period that Iran is about six to seven months away from having the nuclear bomb. Now, that is highly debated. Uh, for example, the former uh, director of the, or one of the former directors of the German National Intelligence, BND, Hans-Dieter Hermann, just recently said that their estimate is that Iran will only have uh, enough nuclear enriched material uh, by the spring uh, of 2013, but then it would take them another six months to produce an actual bomb. And that Iran is presently not pursuing a nuclear bomb, but that they want to be, uh, they want to have a nuclear uh, weapon capability, which is a big difference. Now, if then Iran would leave the nuclear proliferation treaty, they would like to be uh, very rapidly in a position to build a bomb. Now that's a completely different situation than what is claimed by Prime Minister Netanyahu. And that is also confirmed by the umbrella organization of all US intelligence services, the NIE, NIE who uh, recently confirmed again that they uh, are convinced that Iran is not pursuing uh, a nuclear program, which it discontinued in 2003. Now, there is uh, <clears throat> basically also a massive argument by the US military and even Israeli military and secret service former heads and present heads that you can negotiate with Iran. And that also it would be very counterproductive to try to take out the nuclear uh, capacities of Iran because the blowback would be uncalculable. Um, it would possibly only delay an Isra Iranian program, uh, but then after such an attack, Iran could not be stopped to develop these nuclear weapons. Uh, there was recently a report by several retired military and diplomats, uh, among them uh, Skullcraft, Edward uh, Cindy, and others, who warned very strongly against a military strike and basically uh, saying that you know this could la last to a many many year long war. But you know such calculations are also you know sometimes not so predictable because at the same time there was a, a war game exercise uh, done by the uh, uh, Saban Center of Mideast Policies of the Brookings Institute, which was reported by David Ignatius yesterday in the Washington Post, uh, which uh, said that any such war could go out of control because the tendency is to misread the signals of the other side and the potential for a complete escalation obviously is extremely there. Now this war uh, against Iran, against Syria, would have already have happened if it would not have been 
for the mobilization uh, efforts for war avoidance, uh, especially by Mr. LaRouche, my husband, who warned against the danger of a thermonuclear war coming out of this uh, as early as uh, early November last year, and the head of the Joint Chief of Staff uh, of the US military, uh, General Dempsey, and other American uh, military, uh, who basically uh, have uh, tried uh, to intervene uh, many times. Now, the war against uh, Libya and the killing of Gaddafi uh, is part of this policy of regime change of the British Empire, of which, unfortunately, the present administration has become uh, a part. Um, <coughs> this is, um, policy would have already continued against Syria and Iran, and ultimately it targeted, uh, is targeting Russia and China. Now, General Dempsey... Um, uh, recently intervened again and said that he does not want to be complicit in an attack uh, against uh, Iran, to which Prime Minister Netanyahu immediately said that he got calls from many leaders in the world warning him how dangerous such an attack would be, but that he uh, thinks not to attack would be more dangerous. Now, um, the military and ex-secret services in Israel are warning that if such an attack would occur, it would put the entire region into flames for 100 years or more to come. Well, it could be that this conflict is almost already out of control. You already have a clash of civilization going on, uh, a war between the Sunni and the Shiites, a war between the Muslims and the Christians, which is all steered uh, by you know, the policies uh, in the final analysis of the British Empire. And what comes to mind at this point is a quote by Friedrich Schiller from his Wallenstein trilogy, the Piccolomini part, uh, <clears throat> Act 5, Scene 1, uh, that it is the curse of the evil deed, that it permanently must regenerate new evil deeds. And where this applies, in my view, is what happened at the Trilateral Commission meeting in 1975 in Tokyo, where not only it was decided to have a policy of the so-called, quote, controlled disintegration of the world economy, uh, a conscious deindustrialization, post-industrial utopian scheme, which was part of the paradigm which is uh, responsible for the present collapse of the transatlantic region. But what was also decided at that point was the policy of the Islamic card against the Soviet Union in the war against Afghanistan. And this led to the creation and support of the Mujahideen uh, in the 10 years uh, from you know, the, the 80s uh, leading you know, to the final, uh, you know, end of, of uh, or contributing to the end of, of the Soviet Union. Now, uh, the situation in Afghanistan presently is as lost, if not more lost, for the war partners as it was for the Soviet Union in 1990. Senator McCain, uh, after Republican Congressman Bill Young, the Chairhouse Appropriations Subcommittee on Defense Chairman, uh, is calling for the immediate withdrawal of, Afghani, uh, of U.S. and NATO troops from Afghanistan. McCain said, in light of the killings of U.S. soldiers by trainees, uh, the discontin uh, discontinuation of the training and patrolling, there is no reason to stay there should be an orderly retreat now. The situation in Afghanistan is completely hopeless. And if you look at the unnecessary death of many soldiers, uh, you can only say this was a, a, terrible, a terrible war um, which should never have started. Then you look at the situation in Syria. As part of the regime change policy to overthrow President Assad, who, after all, is the head of a secular state where you had the peaceful coexistence of all religions, 
Uh, now, all of a sudden, as part of this regime change policy, he became the dangerous dictator. Now, the German foreign minister, Westerwelle, even expelled the Syrian ambassador. And uh, this despite the fact that it was clear from the beginning, and the proof uh, is that we stated so, and also Mideast experts like uh, Mr. Scholatour and others, it was clear from the beginning that the so-called opposition in uh, Syria was financed and supported by Saudi Arabia, by Qatar, by uh, Libyan mercenaries, by Al-Qaeda forces coming from Iraq. And um, so, uh, you know, when President Putin uh, a short while ago said, well, why don't they just open the prison of Guantanamo, release all the prisoners, arm them and send them to support the rebels in Syria, he hit the nail on the, the uh, point because these are the same people the United States is fighting war against in Afghanistan, allied with in Syria, and uh, you know who in all likelihood had a hand in the killing of the US ambassador in Benghazi. Now, if this policy is coherent, I don't know uh, uh, what, uh, what is not. Now, the assassination of US ambassador Stevenson in Benghazi uh, it was officially said by the Obama administration was supposed to be the result of a big demonstration getting out of control as a result of protest against this uh, video. But that was absolutely not true. Um, this video, by the way, is a blasphemic piece of filth, which is disgusting, but it had nothing to do with the murder uh, of uh, uh, Ambassador Stevenson. Now, the official American line promoted in the beginning by uh, President Obama, by Susan Rice, and also Hillary Clinton uh, was clearly uh, not the full story. And now The Guardian and other papers are having many more details than what Hillary Clinton yesterday uh, presented in a, in a hearing uh, in the Senate. The president of Libya uh, basically, and the police locally said, this had nothing to do with the video, but this was a pre-planned action uh, to uh, do something on the anniversary of September 11th. These were people who came in from Mali, from Algeria, four, four weeks before. Uh, and, and then when there was a hearing in the Senate, Senator Susan Collins uh, contradicted this official line by saying that she got a classified hearing uh, that the whole thing was pre-planned to occur on 11 September, and uh, that basically, uh, you know, she was totally horrified that there were no marine, uh, no, no marines to protect the, the compound. That security had been outsourced to a private British firm linked to the SAS uh, Blue Mountains, and uh, therefore the whole thing looks a little bit different uh, altogether. And this is why Mr. Larouche called it. September 11, number two. Now, to shed light on what is really going on, uh, it is very useful to look at a book published by Senator Bob Graham already some time ago, uh, who used to be the US Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, and he shared the September 11 Joint Congressional Commit uh, Commission on US Intelligence Failures. This book, which has the title Intelligence Matters, the CIA, the FBI, Saudi, Saudi Arabia, and the Failure of, Amer of the American War on Terrorism, uh, he expresses his view that the two presidents, George W. Bush and Obama, willfully covered up the role of Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Royal Fa Family and the Saudi General Intelligence Directorate in the September 11th attacks, that there was a cover-up uh, involving US law enforcement and intelligence agencies. And what angers him particularly is a 28-page chapter of this report, which is still classified. It was classified by President Bush, uh, which pertains to the role of the Saudis, and in particular, uh, the former ambassador, Prince Bandar bin Sultan, 
in the financing of the attacks. Uh, this Prince Banda, by the way, is today the head of intelligence of Saudi Arabia and therefore probably not unrelated to what is happening uh, in the region. Now, Senator Graham reportedly tried several times to convince President Obama to declassify uh, this 28-page uh, chapter, uh, chapter, chapter, which Obama also had promised to the families of the victims of the Twin Tower uh, attack during the election campaign. Now, in these 28 pages, there are also uh, re references to the role of the FBI and a possible multi-level cover-up of their involvement in various Saudi uh, operations uh, in the United States, helping and training and financing the hijackers and the pilots of the planes. And um, for this, just past ele uh, September 11th, Senator Graham wrote an op-ed in the Huffington Post where he says that the mistrust in the official story of what happened on the September 11th, who financed it and who supported it, uh, is still a matter of national security today. Because these networks are still in place and what the joint inquiry uh, had learned and what has emerged since shows where the proverbial finger of suspicion points. It points to Saudi Arabia and we need to know the full truth, wrote Senator Graham. Now, the killing of Ambassador Stevenson, September 11th, number two, uh, was also uh, the issue uh, of uh, a press conference given yesterday by Congressman Walter Jones, Colonel Wilkerson, Bruce Fine, and uh, <clears throat> basically they made very strongly the point that the killing of the ambassador was also the result of the illegal war against Libya and the killing of Gaddafi. Now the implication of the thesis of Bob Graham are enormous uh, because while well, the war against Afghanistan would not have happened if that thesis would have been investigated because the Afghanistan war was uh, called for based on Article 5 of NATO. Uh, so this war needs to be reinvestigated and ended because it was ill-defined from the beginning. Just yesterday, the Russian ambassador to the United Nations, Churkin, uh, made a warning saying that the na discussion within NATO to maintain permanent military bases in Afghanistan uh, after the uh, soldiers have been withdrawn um, are very strange and suspicious. He said, if the war on terrorism is winding down in Afghanistan, yet continued military presence is supposed to be there, then the bases are preserved for some other task that is not linked to Afghanistan. And then he also demanded that there must be a report given to the UN Security Council on the results of the existing mandate and that the mandate only could be continued after a vote and a discussion in the UN Security Council. Now, what other task could the maintenance of military bases in Afghanistan after a withdrawal uh, possibly have? Well, the answer is world empire. Because the real target of all of these developments is Russia and China, who obviously are not part of the British Empire or the Anglo-American British dominated empire. And uh, therefore, you know, one has to look at the strategic picture as a whole to actually see what is happening. You have the American missile defense system in Eastern Europe, which Obama had promised he would review, but now he's continuing. Uh, with the policies of uh, uh, President Bush. Um, now, this Russia totally objects to, understandably, because once this system would be built, it would eliminate the second strike capability of Russia and therefore completely uh, change the strategic balance of nuclear weapons and would equal a capitulation de facto uh, of Russia. Now, uh, <coughs> the... 
uh, statements by General Staff Chief Makarov that the continuation of the building of this missile system could lead to the use of nuclear weapons in Eastern Europe better be taken serious and not be dismissed as for internal use as it has been uh, poo-pooed uh, by some people. Because you have to see it together uh, with the encirclement of China, which was escalated by President Obama in his recent uh, trip to, the, to Asia end of last year. Uh, Japan right now is discussing the abandonment of Article 9 of its constitution, uh, which is part of it. And there is uh, basically a, a continuous, uh, or there are many new alliances uh, which have only one aim, encirclement of China. Now, there are very serious efforts right now by the US and the Russian military uh, to have a war avoidance policy. Um, but, you know, it is not clear if this <laughs> will be enough given what is going on. Right now, there is a big maneuver involving 25 nations in the Strait of Hormuz. Um, <clears throat> they just concluded uh, a Russian strategic command post exercise called Kaskas 2012, uh, which was presided over by Joint Chief of Staff Makarov, uh, and which is aimed, among other things, or was aimed at the protection of the southern flank, uh, which obviously would be heavily um, targeted and involved if there would be an Iranian attack on Iran. Now, if it would come uh, to uh, an escalation in the Middle East. The possibility that it not only would lead to the use of one nuclear weapon, but it is the nature of the war, of danger of war with thermonuclear weapon that they would be used fully, uh, and that would be the extinction of civilization. Now, Hiroshima, the nuclear bomb in Hiroshima, was a 15 kiloton bomb. One Trident II missile has eight W88 warheads, which have 253 times the uh, power of the little boy uh, bomb of Hiroshima. First clip, please. Yes, here you see uh, pictures of maneuvers, which could be those uh, in the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, this would be the launching of such a nuclear missile, the blast, a nuclear explosion. The following fire blades forming conditions of complete destruction. Then in the aftermath of that, clouds would prevent the sun to reach the earth. The temperature would probably drop by seven degrees. You would have a nuclear winter and there would be probably no human beings and no uh, other species alive after such a blast. Now, this is the immediate danger. This thing could go out of control. And the problem is that this has been building up for a very, very long time. I mean, these deployments and putting into place of capabilities are not something sudden, but this has been building up. The Cold War mentality continued to exist long after the disintegration of the Soviet Union. But the timing of the immediate danger does have eminently to do with the fact that we are seeing now the end phase of the collapse of the transatlantic region of the Eurozone, but also the dollar zone. You have right now uh, de facto the limitless injection of liquidity in the financial system. For Germany and for Europe and for the world, one can say the date of the September uh, 12th uh, may turn out to be a very fatal date because this is the day 
when the Karlsruhe Constitutional Court in Germany basically gave the green light for the European stability mechanism, a terrible construction which would give the banking system an unlimited dictatorship uh, if it ever uh, starts to function, uh, they gave the green light for it to go ahead with sm two small provisions, namely that the German representative in the ESM governing council and the German parliament have to agree if the German contribution in the ESM is supposed to be increased. But that is no reason for consolement, given the fact that Mr. Schäuble is known to want to rush to a United States of Europe in some form as quickly as he can and transfer all sovereignty to the Brussel uh, bureaucracy. And the record of the German parliament in the recent period uh, is basically that they often did not even read the documentation on which they were voting. Now, in a certain sense, even the ESM decision is terrible. It has been already made obsolete by a similar decision by the European Central Banks, a bank six days earlier, where they decided that they would from now on limitless buy state bonds uh, of uh, countries in trouble uh, of the Eurozone. Now this quantitative easing also was announced by Bernanke and the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is presently putting approximately 85 billion per month new liquidity into the system. Now this is hyperinflationary. Everybody who is not a complete uh, believer in the present uh, predatory system knows that. And I must uh, praise the chairman of the German Bundesbank, uh, Jens Weidmann, who has been standing up in a very courageous way as the only opposing voice in the European Central Bank board. And he recently uh, basically made a huge attack on the EZB by saying uh, an argument which we have said many times that money as such does not have any value. It's just paper, paper with a print on it. Uh, and then, which is laudable for a chief of the Bundesbank, uh, used a literary, literary uh, reference, namely uh, from Goethe's Faust uh, part two, where Mephisto uh, in the story makes a deal with the bankrupt emperor, promising him limitless money. And first it seems to help, but then soon the resulting inflation is destroying the financial system and the state. And Goethe, which is also interesting, describes the creation of inflationary money as a continuation of the policy of alchemy, where people tried to make gold out of lead. Uh, in modern times, um, it's the same thing when you are trying to make money out of paper or out of electronics, because nowadays, you know, you can push the delete button in a computer and all this virtual money would disappear without much consequence. Now, uh, Weidmann basically said, the method by central banks to create money out of nothing is something mystical, almost dreamlike, but maybe more nightmare-like. Uh, Weidmann then said that the central bankers ma manage a public good, and therefore they need to uh, justify themselves publicly. And then he called for a public debate on the policy of the European Central Bank. And that was also an announcement by the Karlsruhe Constitutional Court that they will hold a hearing in a few weeks on the policy and role of the European Central Bank. Now, the reason why this issue is especially hot in Germany is because we had the experience of the hyperinflation in 1923. And we all have from stories from our families or from studying history books, the experience that hyperinflation is the most brutal form of expropriation. When people think they have a life saving, they have a secured pension, they have some money in the bank for their old days, well, then soon you realize you have to pay whatever you thought your life work was for one piece of bread because that's what happened in 1923. 
Now today, there are approximately maybe 1.5 to 2, 2, tri 2 quadrillion outstanding derivative contracts uh, there. Maybe more, because nobody knows, because there is no transparency, you have the shadow banking. But we are talking about quadrillions. Now, if you try to refinance that, as it has been happening essentially since 2007, but especially since 2008, through so one bailout package after the other, you end up with that kind of hyperinflation, except this time not in one country, but in the entire transatlantic region. Now, in Germany, there is a huge fear about that. And there are now, even in the mainstream media, tons of articles appearing, uh, which were the 56 worst, worst hyperinflations in history. Now, number one was Hungary uh, between August 45 and July 1946, where you had 207% daily inflation. During the French Revolution, you had 204% per month. In 1923, which was one of the first uh, five, one of the five worst inflations, a daily inflation of 20.9%, and every four days, the doubling of the price. In the end, many people used the paper money coming as money from the printer to fire their stove directly because it would be more efficient than to buy wood, which would have doubled its price, and therefore people burned it directly. And after the whole thing was over in uh, December 1923, people used these money uh, notes as wallpaper because it was the cheapest paper uh, to be had. Now, uh, Zimbabwe in 2008, a daily inflation of 98%. Every 25 hours, the price was doubling. And even the banks, Deutsche Bank and others, are now saying, oh, yes, uh, the price for saving the euro is inflation. Now, what is not yet settled is how fast this will happen and how quick. Well, I can tell you very fast. Can we see, please, the triple curve? Because what you have is, while you have this tremendous uh, inflation in the financial aggregates, this is the upper green curve, uh, you have uh, a complete collapse of the physical economy, which is the downward directed blue curve. For example, in Italy, the annual collapse of industrial production right now is minus 7.5%. Spain, minus 4.4%, 5.4%. Greece, minus 5.3%. In July, however, minus 7.8%. France, minus 0.3%. And even Germany, who is supposed to pay for all of this, uh, had a shrinkage of its industrial production of 1.7%. The worst figure is the collapse of the durable consumer goods in Italy by 10%. And that is also directly the result of uh, Mario Monti's pro uh, property tax for real estate, which means now households cannot buy any more cars or domestic, uh, domestic appliances, TVs, and, and so forth. Now, uh, the central bankers... Uh, are doing this, uh, obviously, without having any respect for the effect on the social life, on the economy, because the real economy is collapsing um, at a very fast rate. Uh, the Greek, Greek economy has contracted since 2008 by 25%. Uh, this will be until uh, the end of next year according to official data. This has led to a complete desperation. The suicide rates have gone up. Uh, the reduction of life expectancy. Uh, in, in essence, there are no more hospitals where children can be treated for heart problems. In Spain, the youth unemployment is by now 55% average. In Andalusia, 70%. For many children in Spain, the only kind of meal they get uh, is 
uh, the one meal they get uh, financed by the school. Uh, so uh, the so-called success story of Portugal, which was lo long held by the EU as fulfilling all the austerity policies of the Troika, they had now over the weekend, uh, last weekend, a mass demonstration of one million people in the streets of Portugal in 40 cities and people were yelling, hunger, hunger. Now, the fury of desperation obviously is especially strong among the young generation, which under these circumstances has no future in their own country nor in the rest of Europe. Now, for Portugal, a small country, one million people in the street, that is the equivalent as if you would have 30 million in the street in the United States. And just remember the one million March in Washington was a little bit more than a million or at most two million. Now the situation for the young people in Portugal, Spain, most of Italy, Greece, but also increasingly many other countries is just horrible. Uh, there is no perspective. Uh, with the programs of the EU right now, uh, young people in Portugal and Spain go on the street and say, what are we supposed to be? A country of waiters, uh, only living from tourism? Now, this thing will explode in this coming weeks. In Spain, for the 25th of September, they have announced the next major action, calling on uh, to surround the parliament, take it over. Uh, there will be, uh, there is a call by the Public Power Corporation Labor Union uh, on their fellow unionists to bring Greece, to bring Greece uh, also to a standstill, uh, to force the government to abandon the presently implemented austerity measures. They also call for taking over the ministries and public buildings. The Spanish Bishop of the Armed Forces, Januario Torgal, uh, warned this government will leave the streets will leave streets behind which will be covered by corpses now in light of this uh, the proposal of uh, so called economist Stieglitz that Spain uh, should stay in the euro because the price of leaving it would be too high uh, can only be regarded as utterly incompetent the idea of creating a banking union which he also advertises uh, and uh, mutualization of the debt uh, is also uh, hyperinflationary. And then he blames Germany of being responsible for the present crisis. Now, I can only reject this entirely because the German population is equally the victim of this present policy. More to the point was Argentine uh, prime, uh, President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, who in August uh, reminded people of a speech of her late husband, Nestor Kirchner, uh, in front of the UN General Assembly in 2003, uh, who warned at the time that the dead cannot pay their debt. Now, we are today in Europe at a point uh, which reminds you of Friedrich Schiller's remarks in Don Carlos, where uh, Marquis von Posa uh, accuses Prince Philip uh, that his policy for Spain is only bringing the peace of a graveyard. Now, that is the danger of all of Europe. Now, all these proposals which are on the table right now, the European stability mechanism as a permanent bailout fund, a banking union, a mutualization of the debt, euro bonds, a United States of Europe, all of this will not function because simply there is no European people. We have minimum 27 nations, 27 histories, languages, and nobody in Europe except of a minor uh, by bureaucracy and, and, and some people who profit from the present system do regard themselves as a European nation. We are not. This again is the curse of the evil deed which permanently gives rebirth to more evil. Namely, when the euro was enforced on Europe, especially on Germany, as a price for German unification. Uh, and 
it was the geopolitical aim to turn Europe into the junior partner of the Anglo-American empire at the time. And remember that Amato, who was one of the architects of the Lisbon Treaty, or rather the reformulation of the European constitution to become only a treaty because it was f flatly voted no by the French and the Dutch populations, had actually said, why not go back to the Middle Ages? You know, feudalism was such a beautiful thing. And that is exactly what the present policy uh, of uh, the EU uh, represents. Now, this is not acceptable. And the alternative does exist. It is easy, relatively easy, but it requires the political will. What needs to be done as an absolute first step is the reintroduction of Glass-Steagall in the tradition of Franklin D. Roosevelt, a complete separation of the banks, commercial banks and investment banks, and the commercial banks have to be put under the state protection to be able to give credits to the real, real economy. The investment banks must bring their books in order without having access to the assets of the commercial banks or being financed by taxpayer money. If they have to close their books or close their bank, well, that is uh, too bad, but not a disaster. Now, the next step has to be, and Klaus Stiegel right now is, is fortunately everywhere in discussion. There is the Cup Tour bill in the United States. There is a debate in almost every European country for Klaus Stiegel. And uh, therefore, it could be put on the table immediately. And we have to fight for it. And we, I'm asking all of you viewers, fight for the implementation of Klaus Stiegel preferably this month, because this is the best war avoidance policy uh, you, you can have. Secondly, uh, we have to cancel all the EU treaties from Maastricht to Lissabon. Now, the argument that this would be a disaster is a complete concoction. Uh, Peter Bofinger, uh, one of the five wise uh, guys, Today has an article in Die Welt saying a return to the DMARC would be a catastrophe. Now, I doubt that Mr. Bofinger uh, is really competent uh, to judge that because until very recently, he did not even acknowledge that we have a systemic crisis of the system. And why should you listen to economists who did not pr foresee the crisis concerning their advice, what should be done now? Now, Europe existed and functioned very well before the Maastricht Treaty. And we need to have sovereignty over our own currency. We need to have a new D-Mark, a new Drachme, a new Lira, etc. Uh, simply because uh, that is the only way how countries can fulfill and how states and, and governments can fulfill their uh, oath to protect the common good. Now, we need, and fortunately, the Karlsruhe uh, ruling from the 12th of September, the last paragraph had a clear reference to which international laws apply in case a country wants to leave the European Monetary Union and return to their national control over currency and uh, economy. Uh, then we need, as part of this package, an immediate implementation of fixed exchange rates. Now, this is important because we have to prevent speculators like George Soros to make billions in a week by speculating against uh, the life work or work of decades of nations. Then we need to have a credit system. We have to replace the present bankrupt monetary system with a credit system in the tradition of Alexander Hamilton, the national bank we, he created, or also uh, the uh, Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau in the reconstruction of Germany, which after all uh, used the principles of Roosevelt's reconstruction finance corporation to turn Germany in a few years from a rubble field into the famous German economic miracle. Now, a credit system 
uh, is uh, something contrary to a monetary system where you create uh, money to pay debt, old debt of the past. In a credit system, the state issues credit towards future production. And in every case where this has been done internationally, uh, like you know, in the Franklin D. Roosevelt period, like in the post-war reconstruction of Germany, it can be proven that because of the impulse to the primary and secondary impulse to the real economy, the tax revenue after a few years is always much higher than the initial credit given. And that has everything to do with the power of human labor to create more wealth, uh, to generate uh, uh, added value, to, to implement the results of scientific and technological uh, progress in the form of technology which increases the productivity in the production process. And therefore, this kind of money generation is not inflationary. It is not the same kind of money creation like what is doing is being done by the central banks right now. Now, this was done by Roosevelt. This is how he got the United States out of the depression. And in Germany, in the beginning of the 30s, there were similar proposals, the famous uh, Wald, uh, Lautenbach plan, uh, which was more or less the same like Roosevelt's New Deal. Uh, there was a plan by the uh, General Trade Union uh, Organization, the RDGB, which was called the VTB plan. All of these plans basically said the state has to create credit to eliminate unemployment, to create productive jobs, and uh, basically by providing for productive full employment, you eliminate the conditions of the crisis and you eliminate the cost of unemployment, you generate the wealth for sustained uh, maintenance of society. Unfortunately, as we know, the Lautenbach plan and the VTB plan were not implemented. If they had been implemented in 1931, in 1933, the conditions which allowed Hitler to come to power would have been eliminated. So we better learn the lesson of this now and turn away from the utterly disgusting Brüning policy of austerity, which is being implemented by the Troika uh, right now. Now, the concrete focus of such a change in the uh, financial system is a plan which we have presented uh, a couple of months ago. It's called the Plan for the Reconstruction of uh, <clears throat> the Southern Europe, the Mediterranean, and Africa. Now, can we have that clip, please? Now, this is the World Land Bridge. This is an idea which we have proposed since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, which has been expanded into a worldwide uh, connection of infrastructure projects, of uh, large water management projects like Navapa, like the Transaqua system. And it would basically mean to provide uh, the entire world with the necessary infrastructure, which presently only some countries enjoy, like Germany, uh, which has a very well functioning infrastructure. Now, this is the extension into the Balkans. Uh, this is uh, connecting the Rhein-Main-Donau water system uh, of Europe with channel, canals uh, and river systems to the Mediterranean. It means building some of the, this is now the uh, connection of the bridge of Messina between Italy and Sicily, and then a tunnel between Sicily and Tunisia, uh, where uh, a tunnel will be built with uh, five artificial islands uh, so that basically uh, you could connect the European transport system with Africa. Another very important project is the connection of the street through Gibra uh, tunnel under the Strait of Gibraltar. And this is the so-called Africa Pass, connecting the water, uh, the amounts of water from the Congo region through a channel system uh, all the way to the Mediterranean uh, where you could develop agriculture uh, where presently is uh, only desert 
and in connection with the Transaqua project, uh, this would begin to transform Africa completely, eliminate hunger and starvation and uh, you know, diseases in a very short, short period of time. Now, this project, can you please just have a still picture of the World Land Bridge? Uh, this project um, for Europe, for Southern Europe, the Mediterranean, and Africa is not all that revolutionary. Some parts of it are, like a science driver component by building a space station in the Canary Island, by having a science center in essence. But most of the projects, including uh, the development corridors uh, into the Balkans, into the south of Italy, uh, into uh, the Iberian Peninsula are all projects which were already agreed upon by the EU transport ministers at a conference in Crete in 1994. They decided on 10 uh, priority uh, corridors, uh, which five of the, this would have gone into the Balkans, into Greece, uh, others into Italy and Spain and Portugal. And they essentially, except very tiny components of it, have never been built, uh, mainly because of the crisis which then erupted and the austerity programs, but also because there was this paradigm shift very much to the green ideology, uh, which is right now uh, uh, controlling the guidelines of the European Union. Now, this poll can be presented in another webcast earlier. You can find it here in the archive on this webpage. So I do not want to repeat all the arguments from that. You also find the written report, which we are translating right now uh, into all relevant languages. Um, but you know, this program could be started tomorrow. It would give a vision for Spain, for Portugal, for Italy, for uh, <coughs> the Mediterranean, for Africa, and it would absolutely change the entire dynamic. But I have to say one provision. You cannot be intimidated by the green ideology. Because how can you survive as a country if you don't produce anything? How can you survive without having a perspective for the young generation and the generations which come after that. Now, the green paradigm uh, is part of the present oligarchical uh, model, which unfortunately has been imposed in the form of the EU uh, on Europe. And it has the idea of reducing the population. Uh, it is absolutely uh, not consistent with the real laws of the universe. and. Um, you know, the proof of that is that the Royal Society in their annual report this year openly said that they uh, want to uh, reduce the world population to 1.5 uh, billion people. Now, the uh, green paradigm, uh, which was introduced as part of the global paradigm shift uh, at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, uh, like the thesis of the Club of Rome, that the world has now reached a limit, that you have to have uh, limits of resources. Because you have supposedly lim limits of resources, you have to have sustainable development, uh, appropriate technology, all code words for no technology, does not correspond to the real universe. The real universe is an anti-entropic developing universe, which always provides for new resources, provided man is using his creative power to determine, you know, through scientific and technological progress, what are the new resources. Now, the world population right now is 7 billion people. And, well, I mean, we could easily feed these people and many more. There are many projects to, you know, make life better, uh, on this planet. Now, do you think that the condition of Africa is a natural phenomena? Do you think it is like that because the people in Africa do not want to develop? 
No, the aim of the oligarchy is to reduce the world population to one or two billion people, as Prince Philip has said many times, as many other people like uh, Schellenhuber in Germany who wants to have a one billion uh, population. And they want to turn Europe into a feudal society. I already mentioned Amato, um, who has basically praised the Middle Ages, uh, but I think that that is not the road to go because this will lead to a terrible, terrible social explosion this month, that next month, and a collapse of society. Now, we have provided the outlines of a recovery program uh, because it is not enough to be against the austerity imposed by the Troika right now. But we have to have a positive vision of what we want Europe to look like. I want to have a Europe of sovereign nation states, of a revival of the high periods of classical culture, like the ancient Greek classical culture, like the Andalusian Renaissance in Spain, like the Italian Renaissance of the 15th century, and use that high level, or the German classical period, and use that to create something new for all of mankind. And I'm calling upon everybody who is watching this webcast to help us to mobilize for that mission. Because I think all which is necessary right now is to inspire the population that such an alternative exists. Now, we have to do a couple of other things. We have to change the paradigm of thinking completely. Because if we stay in the present paradigm of present geopolitical politics of the transatlantic region of the program conflict with Russia and China, it is very clear civilization is probably going the way the dinosaurs went approximately 65 million years ago. There are fortunately thinking people uh, who realize that we need to change something. And I want to mention the Euro-Atlantic Security Initiative, uh, EASY, uh, which has been presented this February of this year by uh, former Senator Sam Nunn, uh, the present head of the Munich Security Conference, Wolfgang Ischinger, and the Russian uh, Igor Ivanov, uh, because they obviously also realize that the present Cold War thinking uh, is uh, having the explosive potential for a catastrophe. They denounce this Cold War thinking. They call for an inclusive, undivided, functioning Euro-Atlantic security community where all disputes should be solved by diplomatic, legal, or other nonviolent means without ever re uh, the recourse to military force. They also want to have a demil demilitarization of the relation between the United States, NATO, and Russia. And they say that if such a treaty or alliance would be adopted, this would be a complete game changer. And indeed, that is what we need, a game changer. But even better and even more uh, reaching into the future is another proposal which was presented by the former Russian ambassador uh, to NATO, uh, Rogozin, uh, who is now one of the vice uh, prime ministers, uh, who made the proposal of the so-called strategic defense of the earth. Now, this is a conception of a collaboration among nations of the world, very much an extension and in the tradition of the SDI proposal, which uh, my husband made and which uh, uh, President Reagan announced as the official uh, American policy in 1983. Now, what this focuses on is, among other things, uh, the very much live and existing danger of a serious asteroid impact, which could be as devastating uh, to civilization as a nuclear war. Uh, and you know those people who think that this is esoteric and why should I be concerned about comets and asteroids, you better go to the uh, web pages of NASA and of the ESA and look that there are indeed 
many, many such asteroids uh, with a trajectory either towards Earth or maybe towards Earth, and that there is right now a massive increase of such activity, which has to do with the cyclical developments of the position of our planet uh, in, uh, uh, in the uh, gal galaxy. Therefore, the idea that one does not have to prepare for this possibility of an impact is a dangerous folly. Now, uh, can we go back to the uh, pictures? Uh, the first, the uh, asteroid comet size uh, statistics. No, the statistics. Yes. <clears throat> now, here you see uh, what is the impact of asteroids or comets. For example, if you have an asteroid of uh, 30 meter diameter, this would be uh, a minor damage relatively. 50 meter diameter already would be comparable to the largest thermonuclear weapon in existence. But if you go to the possibility of a comet of 10,000 uh, meter diameter, uh, this would have um, energy released of uh, 80 million megatons TNT. And that would be the complete extinction of the human species. Now, such things did happen in the past. Uh, if you look at the um, at the um, uh, so-called Tunguska event, which happened in uh, uh, 1908, uh, and it hit an area of 2,150 square kilometers in Siberia. Uh, and on the right side, you see the equivalent area if such an uh, impact would occur in New York City. It would eliminate quite an area. Now, please have the comparison of the Mount Everest and such an asteroid. Now, here you can see uh, Mount Everest having 8,848 kilometers. And compared to uh, one large asteroid of 10,000 kilometer, I mean, just imagine if Mount Everest would hit with a velocity of uh, many, many, uh, yeah, many, many uh, kilometers, it would blast the Earth out of the water. Now look at the last 500 million years. Now this has happened uh, repeatedly, and it many times was related to the so-called big extinctions. The last, which occurred uh, approximately 65 million years ago, where up to 98 percent of all species got eliminated. Um, yeah, so I mean, this is a very real, uh, very real uh, danger. And presently, uh, we are, as a civilization, not equipped to do anything about it. But if we have the ambition to be smarter than the dinosaurs, we better start to invest massively in meant space travel, uh, in uh, the kind of research which would enable us to detect the trajectory of such uh, objects. And um, well, I mean, basically, uh, therefore, the proposal of the SDE should be put on the, on the table uh, for serious. Uh, now, <coughs> this all requires a complete change in the self-conception of man. We have to stop being infants. We have to stop thinking uh, that we should have geopolitical wars for raw materials, for you know, power, for all kinds of things. And we have to make that jump to concentrate on the common aims of mankind instead. Now, this involves the common mastery of new scientific principles. We have to consciously start the next phase of the evolution of mankind. If you go to the writings of the German former uh, scientist, later American German scientist, Kraft Erike, who called manned space travel the absolutely necessary next phase of evolution of mankind. Uh, 
that life developed out of the oceans on the planet on the on the ground then man conquered the planet through infrastructure development and now manned space travel is the next phase of the evolution of mankind and in order to make sure that civilization will be an eternal civilization and not have the same fate like previous species which got wiped out we better start to rethink who man is in the universe Kraft Erika, who was a dear friend of mine and of our organization, used to call it the extraterrestrial imperative, meaning that you know, man consciously starts to explore uh, the galaxy, consciously becomes rational by only acting on scientific principle and not on popular opinion or other such positivist uh, uh, conceptions. And I think we have come a big step closer to this point with the absolutely exciting landing of the Mars rover Curiosity, where now basically the first step of mankind into the near galaxy has been accomplished because now not only was the first voice uh, <coughs> heard to be heard, human voice to be heard from Mars in the form of a transmission of the commander of the space station on Earth, but we have now senses we can hear, see, smell on Mars, but you know, with a difference uh, of about 14 minutes and transmitted by the speed of light. So the Curiosity landing gives you a pretaste of where mankind can go, that we indeed are at the beginning of a new epoch. Now Kraft Erike, who was a fantastic human being, um, also uh, said, and he was one of the leading space uh, scientists, he said, despite the fact that he developed the Saturn uh, rocket of the Apollo project and many other things, he said a technology is never good or bad. It is always man who either brings this technology for a good purpose or for an evil one. And therefore, towards the end of his life, he agreed with us in saying that the aesthetical education of man must go along with the scientific development. Now, I totally believe that, um, that that is possible and that if we do that, then not only can we deter the present dangers, but we can start a new phase of mankind. Now, the reason why I'm, despite the, all the existing dangers, so optimistic that it is possible has to do with the thinking of such people as Nikolaus of Kuhs and Johannes Kepler, who uh, Johannes Kepler, while studying the stars, came to the conclusion that the universe is so full of beauty that it, it clearly reflects in its lawfulness a loving creator and that if we do our job right now and act in the image of that creator I think that we have reached a punctum salience in mankind's history where we can make the jump so that mankind finally can become adult. <laughs>